It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you are able to join us on Sunday morning, either at 9 o'clock or at 10.30. Remember, we are continuing to do the signing up with Sign Up Genius. I will send out a link either Friday or Saturday along with the bulletin. If any of you have any trouble with that, please get in touch with either me or Kenna. We'd be glad to help out with that. If you have any prayer concerns, I hope you'll let me know. Give me a call at 608-224-0274 or use the contact information that will be on the screen in just a little bit and send me an email and I would love to hear from you anything that we need to update in our bulletin. As you can see I am in a different place tonight than I have been over the last few weeks. Last week we were at the base of one of the towers out at Blue Mound State Park. The week before that I think it was a pear tree in our front yard and the week before that it was by the shore of Lake Superior out there on the beach just north of Ironwood, Michigan. A beautiful scene and all of those tied in with what we were studying. Today I was hoping to find some sheep and I looked a little bit online to try to find some sheep nearby. I could just not find any sheep for the background. I think there are some sheep out near Josh and Amanda's place out near Arena but was a little bit unsure about the the location whether I could uh, whip out the laptop and sit there for an hour or so and uh, wasn't really sure about that so I figured I'd just stay close to home so today I am back in our garage and we had to get another load of firewood so I had to take down the pictures of the congregation that were behind me for a number of months. I started out on the patio this morning but it was too windy out there. I had the wind chime going and the neighbor mowing the yard and all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, my notes flew up in front of the camera briefly and so I said all right forget it I got to go inside again so I'm back in front of the wood pile although it does not have your pictures on it so nothing personal but I'm back inside for today and I know that we're looking at a high of 92 degrees today one of the warmest days so far this year and so in terms of my good news what I am thankful for today is I saw a weather forecast or heard it on the radio or online somewhere that said we're expecting a snowier winter than usual and I know not all of you are looking forward to that I am I love all of the seasons I suppose so it is coming we're just a few weeks away from the fall and I'm looking forward to the changing of the seasons, which is just a beautiful thing about living here in South Central Wisconsin. So a lot that we can be thankful for. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, for those of you who maybe have not been joining us over the past several months, we know Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. And he writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. And we looked into that as to what that name means and, and some characteristics of these two books. We know that he makes a point of writing the book of Luke in particular in chronological order. And so that is distinctive as a feature of this book as opposed to the other three gospel accounts. Luke also makes a point of including a number of people who were often excluded in the ancient world, especially the Jewish world. They were oppressed. Women... Uh, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans, as well as a number of sick. Uh, last week we looked at Luke chapter 14 where Jesus once again heals a man on the Sabbath day. He then goes on to give the parable of the wedding feast. He teaches a number of important, very valuable lessons based on attending banquets. The idea of accepting the invitation, that uh, struggle to find where to sit. And of course many of the leading Jewish people were choosing the chief places and so he takes that and he uses that to teach a lesson and a number of other things we looked at in chapter 14 he then tells his disciples that he must always come first in their lives above all other priorities and so tonight we continue with another series of parables and these are found in Luke chapter 15 so if you're not there already hope you'll look with me at Luke chapter 15 and the first paragraph is Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. So let's notice what Jesus says. Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. 
And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. First of all, let's notice up at the beginning of this chapter, who is listening? We find that the tax collectors and the sinners were there. They were paying attention. We understand the tax collectors, they were hated by many people, as we've studied many, many times before. Even today, I'm guessing that uh, most people who work for the IRS might not uh, throw that out there the very first time they meet somebody. Uh, obviously, it is an honorable profession, but many of us have some issues about paying taxes. Sometimes it's very complicated. We aren't really looking forward to paying taxes, we might say. We look at the government, we see some financial mismanagement, we see money being wasted, and so there is this reluctance to fork it over. Well, back in Jesus' day, though, it was so, so much worse than that. Rome was an occupying force, and tax collector positions were often offered up to the highest bidder, and so it was a position ripe for abuse. Dishonest men could win the bid to be tax collectors. They would then have some level of backup and protection from the Roman soldiers who were there in the area, and then they could collect taxes from their own people, and they were allowed to keep a certain percentage, and what was above and beyond that, that was theirs to keep. And so I think we understand why uh, those who filled those positions were hated. And they were seen as being dishonest traitors. But what's interesting is these people followed Jesus. They were rejected by their own people. The Romans really weren't fans of the tax collectors either. But Jesus found them. And so they spent a lot of time hanging out together. Uh, Matthew, one of the Lord's original 12, the 12 apostles, he was a tax collector. And many tax collectors rejected by their own friends and family they found a friend in Jesus. And so they came to listen. We find that in verse number one. Also in verse one, sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. Of course, I thought all of us were sinners. Uh, we are. And so I would take this as a reference to those who were seen to be sinners. They were known for being sinners. You would look at them and you would say, that is a sinful person. And so that kind of person came to Jesus. So everybody sins, but these sins were more obvious. Uh, some sins, in the view of many, are, are less respectable than others. And so I would uh, see the reference to sinners in verse 1 as a reference to people who were known as being sinners. These people uh, were those who had a reputation of some kind. Their sins were not as hidden as the rest of ours might be. They were coming near to listen to Jesus along with the tax collectors. Uh, now, in response to seeing this, we find the scribes and the Pharisees begin to grumble uh, grumbling, by the way, is often a sin in and of itself. And so they were sinning by grumbling about sinners, which is an interesting thing to consider. Uh, as we have often noted, God has killed more people for the sin of whining than for any other sin. Grumbling is what led God to destroy an entire generation of Israelites in the wilderness. And so the scribes and the Pharisees are grumbling, and they're grumbling about Jesus receiving sinners and eating this meal with them. They perhaps saw Jesus as accepting of these people and maybe approving sinful behavior. Uh, we, know, know, we know, however, Jesus does not endorse. He does not encourage sin. And so there must be something else going on here. It must be possible to associate with sinful people without actually sinning ourselves. And that's what the Lord is doing uh, but, of course, that leads to these three parables in this chapter in response to their whining about this. We start with the parable of the lost sheep. And so this is a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, as we have sometimes defined what a parable means. Um, it's a story about sheep. It's also a story that's not really about sheep, is it? On the surface, it's about sheep, but of course, it's a lot deeper than that. And this is personal. This is something we can relate to. Uh, many of those who are listening have perhaps been in that situation. They have been taking care of sheep. They know what a shepherd is. If not, uh, they can certainly imagine it. They can identify with this. They can picture this. A man has a hundred sheep, but he's responsible for caring for. One gets lost, and so he goes out, he leaves the 99 out in the open pasture, 
and he goes and looks for the one who is lost until he finds it. Everybody would do this. This is not debatable. Uh, this is something everybody would have done in this situation. Nobody be, would be okay with simply losing a sheep and forgetting about it and moving on. A shepherd's job is to keep the sheep safe, and losing one is absolutely unacceptable. Then notice when he finds the one sheep, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So he's absolutely thrilled at this. And then he comes home and he basically throws a huge party. He gets his friends and his neighbors together. He celebrates. And so in the first parable, the sheep wanders. Uh, it's not getting into trouble on purpose. This is not a rebellious sheep as far as we can tell here. Uh, but the sheep itself does play some role in getting lost. As I understand it, sheep will eat themselves right off the edge of a cliff. They eat, they eat, they eat, they eat, and then suddenly they have no idea where they are, and so they wander. It's not malicious, it's just something that they do. They have no real concept of danger or direction. That's why sheep need a shepherd. In verse 7, Jesus applies this parable in the same way, he says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In other words, Jesus as the good shepherd, he seems to be in the process of going out and looking for the one lost sheep. And this involves actually interacting with sinful people, doesn't it? In order to find the lost sheep, he needs to be out there among the lost sheep, tax collectors and sinners. So is he saying that the Pharisees and the, and the scribes are the righteous in this story, that they have no need of repentance, that they're perfect, that they're saved, they don't need the Lord? I, I wouldn't take it in that way. And I say that because Jesus doesn't apply it in this way. He doesn't nail down every aspect of this parable. To me, the emphasis is not on the 99, the emphasis is on the one. That's the whole point of this parable. Anybody listening to this, I think, would have understood what the Lord is saying here. In response to grumbling about spending time with sinners, Jesus tells this parable about a shepherd spending time going after the one lost sheep. And so he is explaining his emphasis here. In a sense, he's defending himself. Not that he needs defending, but he's explaining what he's doing. So what does this look like for us? What do we need to learn from this? It means that as we live our lives, if we're going to be like Jesus, it seems that we need to make sure that we're living on purpose, interacting with those who are lost, living with the mission of finding sheep that are lost and bringing them back. Uh, in the process, uh, we might not pay quite as much attention to those that we know are saved or who don't know that they're lost and don't care. Uh, when we come together for worship, if I have a choice, I might pay more attention to a guest or maybe to a wayward sheep. And we would do this because we're paying more attention to somebody who does not seem to be, uh, who, who does seem to be in spiritual danger. And so if there's somebody who's lost and we know they're lost, uh, it would be wise if we're following the Lord's example here to pay more attention to that person then we might pay attention to somebody else. I know it's very easy to live the Christian life uh, primarily concerned about us while finding, uh, failing to be truly concerned about the lost or those in spiritual danger. Um, it'll take focused effort, we might say, to, to do what Jesus does here. I want to spend time with people like me. Uh, personally, I'd rather hang out eating pizza with my good Christian friends and laughing and joking together and letting my guard down and, and so on, uh, when what I really need to be doing is spending time with those who are truly in spiritual danger. And that seems to be what we can learn here. That takes effort. It's uncomfortable, but this is what Jesus did. Uh, he spent time with the 12 apostles, yes, uh, but he also made a point of putting himself in situations where he could reach out to those who truly needed it. And it seems like that's what we can learn from this. So that's the first parable here, the parable of the lost sheep. So let's move on. Let's notice Luke 15, verses 8 through 10, the second parable of something that's lost in this chapter. Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. 
When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So now we shift from a lost sheep to a lost coin. And one big difference is the sheep, in some way, participated in its lostness, didn't it? But the coin had nothing to do whatsoever with losing itself. With one, we might blame the sheep in some way, but here the woman is the one who loses the coin. In verse 8, the woman has ten silver coin, coins and loses one coin. Most of us know what it means to lose something. We don't intend to lose whatever it is, but we get distracted. Uh, we forget where we put something. We laid it down. We don't come back to it. We're careless in some way. And something that is important to us goes missing. We don't have too much background here, but some have speculated that this is perhaps a coin that was part of her dowry. Uh, maybe a valuable coin that had been passed down in the family for several generations. And when it goes missing, she lights a lamp and she sweeps the house. She searches carefully until she finds it. We think about us losing something today. We lose our keys. We lose a cell phone. Uh, a certain person in our family has a special way of losing keys on a regular basis. In fact, uh, early on in my marriage to this particular person, uh, I made a special key rack and five or six, probably half a dozen uh, matching sets of keys so that when one went missing, another was ready to take its place. I made a little rack with the six spots on it and the, and the sets of keys up there and and, you know, we burned through those sets of keys rather quickly. I was apparently enabling that behavior. <laughs> uh, we then for a while tried a little disc that goes on the keychain. And when you whistle, it would whistle back. And that worked really well until our kids found that they could set it off by screaming. And that did not end well. It did not have an off button. It eventually malfunctioned in the screaming position. And so we ended up putting it in the freezer one night. That's the only thing we could do to make it stop. Uh, now car keys are a lot more expensive than they were 25 years ago. You can't go to Walmart now and get a new car key for $3. A new car key these days is $80 or $100 or $200 or $300. And, um, and we know what it means to lose something like that. Now we have a little set of, it's a paired set of, key fobs, I would say, and they're both kind of whistles. They beep in a particular way, and when you set one off, the other one goes off, and that's how we find our keys now. Uh, but pretty much, I think, when the price of keys went up, we got a lot better at not losing keys around here, but we know what that means. We lose something important. We lose a cell phone, and we tear the house apart. We retrace steps. We dig under car seats, whatever it takes to find what's lost, and that's what happens with this woman. She loses a coin that is very valuable. It's very important to her, and so she tears the house apart until she finds it. When she finds the coin, notice she calls together her friends and her neighbors, just like the shepherd did. And so this is very much parallel to the previous parable. And there is some rejoicing that happens. The, the spiritual application is the same thing happens in heaven. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And the lesson for the scribes and the Pharisees is, you people need to be looking for the lost sheep. You need to be looking for the lost coin. You need to be looking for lost people like Jesus is instead of cutting on him for being out there doing what they need to be doing. I wish we could be together to discuss this a bit more, but maybe we need to be asking ourselves how we're doing in the searching for the lost department as individuals and as a congregation. Are we looking for lost people? like a shepherd looks for a lost sheep and like a woman looks for a lost coin? Or are we more like the scribes and the Pharisees here? And maybe a better question is exactly how can we be more like the shepherd and the woman in these two parables? What can we do to reach out to the lost more effectively? What can we encourage each other uh, to, uh, what can we do to encourage each other to stay strong? Uh, we're obviously uh, still in some very strange times right now, but I can tell you I've been on both the sending and the receiving end of some awesome phone calls this week. Getting calls and giving calls where mutual encouragement has happened. And I'll you know make a call and one of you will pick up and I end up more encouraged than you are by checking in and hearing your voices 
And uh, there is a huge value to that, especially during these strange times. There are some of us who haven't seen each other for five or six months now, and that's hard. And, and some of us, in a sense, are spiritually in danger, and there is some discouragement that's creeping in, and, and we need to be aware of that. We need to keep up with each other. We need to go looking for each other in these difficult times. And uh, even in a socially distant kind of way, I would suggest that just a simple phone call can do a whole lot of good. I'm sure there are other things we can do, but being Jesus might be different for each and every one of us. And so we'll need to continue to brainstorm and really, to, it's, it's up to us. We're in this together and it's just us. No other church is going to come and check on us. Uh, it's as the Four Lakes Church of Christ, uh, we are responsible for each other. So here the big picture is there is rejoicing when what is lost is found, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees who are whining about the lost being found. We do not want to be like that. We want to be like the woman. We want to be like the shepherd. All right, let's move on to the third and final parable in this chapter, Luke 15. Let's start with verses 11 through 16. Luke 15, verses 11 through 16. And he said, A man had two sons, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. So we've moved on from a lost sheep and a lost coin to a lost son. We have a man with two sons, and the younger of the two sons wants his share of the family estate. Some of you may remember Gerald Frump. Gerald came to Madison a number of years ago to tell us more about Schultz Lewis Child and Family Services. That's a Christian a children's home down in Valparaiso, Indiana. And he preached on this passage when he was here, and it's been many years. But in that lesson, I remember he made the point that the youngest son was basically saying, that he wanted his father dead. And I'd never really thought about that before, but if a son comes to his father and demands the family inheritance, that's basically what's happening, isn't it? If we make out the family will, and one of our children comes and says, hey, I want this to go into effect right now, that's a kid we need to keep our eye on, isn't it, as parents? And I'd never thought about that before. But that's what's going on here. Normally in those times, the oldest child would get twice the share of the inheritance than any of the other children. And so in a family with two sons, as this appears to be, the oldest would get two-thirds and the youngest would get the remaining one-third. And so the youngest son was most likely asking for one-third of the family estate, which is probably a huge figure especially for this family, when we think about the family having land and servants and crops. And so this is most likely a huge figure. Even at this point, very early on in the story, with all that we know right now, everybody listening would recognize this as being a bad son. This is not good if your son demands the inheritance in the way that he has. What amazes me here is that the father grants the request. That's strange to me. I don't understand this. If I'm still alive, I don't understand how I can give one-third of my estate to one of my children when I'm still farming the land and, and living in the home and so on. And so as a dad, I'm thinking this is one of those no moments. No, you can't. We're not dead yet to begin with. I mean, this is what I would think. Nevertheless, the father in this story very graciously, uh, in a giving kind of way, apparently shifts some things around and basically pays off the younger son. He allows his son to leave. He doesn't make him a prisoner at home, but he gives him the money. He allows him to go. 
I would also point out that when the father divides his wealth between them, in verse 12, some of you may have a better translation or maybe a footnote on the word wealth. The word translated wealth literally means life. It is the word bios, as in biology, the study of life. And the idea is the father's wealth represents his life. He divided up his life. He gave him his life. And so this is everything that he's accumulated after a lifetime of hard work. It all boils down to this. And he divides it up between his sons. Soon afterwards, the younger son then gathers everything together and he leaves. He goes on a long journey to a distant country where he squanders his estate with loose living. He wastes everything. He, he blows it all through some kind of loose living. I'm thinking back several years ago to getting a desperate call from a Christian mother from down south. She was on her way up to UW Hospital to see her 19-year-old son who was dying of AIDS. This woman was a member of the church from somewhere in Illinois, and she called and she said, I need, uh, I need a preacher. I need somebody to come pray with me at the hospital. I need you to meet me there. And this young man had left home at an early age. He had wasted his life with loose living. Those were, those were her words when she called me. And we showed up together, and this young man was 50 pounds lighter than when he left home. And he was mm -hmm. uh, skinny to begin mm -hmm. with, we might say. Nothing mm -hmm. but skin and bones on life mm -hmm. support. And we prayed together out in the hallway at UW Hospital, but she was obviously torn up. Mm -hmm. She was just crying and bawling and really nothing more that she could do out there uh, in the hallway. And that's what I think of when I read this story. Uh, this father has to be a very painful thing for him to go through, but he allows his son to leave. And just like the young man I described, he was wasting his life on the party scene. That's the picture that I have in my mind here. It's obviously much easier to lose an estate than to build up an estate, isn't it? And so the estate goes very quickly. He burns through everything. Then a famine hits. Then the young man has nothing. And it gets so bad that he even hires himself out to one of the locals, and he's, he's sent out into the fields to feed swine. Now, for a Jew, this was absolutely unheard of. Swine were unclean animals. This would have been humiliating. They didn't have anything to do with pigs. This was against the law of Moses, so here he is, not only feeding the swine, but he's wishing that he could eat right along with the swine. He's hungry. He is absolutely desperate. When my grandfather preached down in Lynchburg, Tennessee, he, had, he was living on the edge of town. Um, actually, I guess we might say all of Lynchburg was the edge of town. There wasn't much to that city, uh, just a few hundred residents. Um, but we would go on walks outside the town and uh, down those winding roads in the hills. And I remember seeing a slop truck pull up beside a, a, fi a pig farm. Uh, Lynchburg is the home of Jack Daniels. And these trucks from Jack Daniels would carry the byproducts of making whiskey. And they would unload them out there in the pig yards outside town. And I remember on one of those walks, seeing one of those trucks pull up, there was a bunch of pigs wallowing in their own waste. Uh, you know, a foot deep, and they're kind of rolling around in it and walking around out there, and this truck pulls up. The driver gets out, opens what I thought to be like a four-inch valve sticking out the back end of that tanker truck, and this slop just blasts out into the field and the mud and the waste, and pigs came running from all directions as soon as they could hear the truck coming. And so here they are standing in their own waste, eating slop mixed in with waste, and they are thrilled. The happiest pigs that you would ever see. And that's what seems to be going on here. The young man is hired on to feed pigs. He's starving hungry, and he's longing to eat what they're eating. And most Jews would have probably let out a gasp at this point. Oh, I can't believe how bad this is. Well, you know, what depths to which he's fallen. This is disgusting. This is wrong. And yet it shows how desperate this young man is. Just a thought question before we move on from this. What if the young man's money 
had never run out? What if it had been an eternal supply of money from the Father? Would he have ever turned back to the Father? I don't think so. And so I think we might say, looking at this, that there is some benefit to hitting rock bottom, as we might say. Uh, there can be a value to hunger and desperation if it drives us to where we need to be. That's not always the way it ends, obviously. Uh, but there can be a value to it, and we see it in this particular parable. All right, let's keep on going. Let's look at Luke 15, verses 17 through 24, the next paragraph here. Luke 15, 17 through 24. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put, him on, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Obviously, verse 17 is a turning point in this parable as the young man comes to his senses. He comes to a point where he's desperate and has nowhere else to go, nothing else he can do. And he suddenly realizes that his old life wasn't really that bad after all. Notice also he's thinking about his father. If this had been a bad father, if his father had been unloving, he would have never returned. But as he's away from home, he remembers his father in a good way. I'm thankful that I can think of my own father like that. I'm thankful that I can think of God like that. Not all people have the same experience with their earthly father. So I'm just pointing that out as a blessing here. He realizes that his father's hired men have more than enough food. And, and here he is dying of hunger. And so he decides to go back to his father. And his plan is to beg for mercy. He plans on apologizing and he's running this through his mind. He's rehearsing what he's going to say. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Obviously, many of us who are familiar with the Bible think about Joseph, don't we? Remember, he turned down the advances from Potiphar's wife by asking, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Joseph wasn't just sinning against Potiphar. He would have been sinning against God if he had done that thing. Joseph knew that what she wanted to do was a sin against the husband and God at the same time. And so that's what this young man is thinking. He understands he sinned against his father. He also knows that he sinned against God. And so he understands this. Um, and I would ask, in what way? What sin has this young man committed? Well, first of all, he's dishonored his father, hasn't he? That's in the Big Ten. That's in the Ten Commandments, isn't it? The Fifth Commandment is to honor your father and his mother. This man has dishonored his father. But then secondly, he's also squandered his estate with loose living. And so any number of other things we could add in here. And so he's truly sinned against heaven. He's also sinned against his father. And this is what he plans to admit when he goes home. He plans on confessing his sin. He also plans on offering himself as a servant. Make me as one of your hired men. I'm unworthy to be your son anymore. Notice, this is a real apology, isn't it? This is the real deal. He's not faking this. These are his real thoughts. This is what he's feeling. Sometimes when people try to apologize, I've found that it comes off often more as an explanation than an apology. You know, I'm sorry for hitting you. I'm sorry that your face was in the way when I swung my fist, is the way some apologies come across. So we refer to that as a non-apology in our family. 
But that's not what we find here. There's no explanation. There's no reason given. He simply apologizes. He's, he's truly sorry for what he's done. So he heads toward home. But notice his father sees him coming when he's still a long way off. What does that tell us? His father is apparently out there on the front porch waiting for his son to come home. His father has the attitude Jesus has toward the lost. He's looking. He's not just minding his own business, going about life, but he's out there, he's looking, scanning the horizon for a familiar face. Not only that, but his father runs and embraces him and kisses him. I see this as a running hug, kiss, tackle. Uh, all in one, the father runs out there and falls upon his son. Uh, however, he never gets around to offering himself as a servant, does he? The son doesn't. He, he doesn't. He, those words don't come out because his father interrupts his planned statement of remorse by telling the servants to go quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, on his hand, put sandals on his feet, bring out the fattened calf, kill it so that we can party, so we can celebrate. Because this son of mine was dead, has come to life again, was lost, and has been found. And this is where Jesus ties this story into the other two in this chapter. They celebrate. There is rejoicing when something that was lost is now found. By the way, I don't know whether you noticed this, but as far as I can tell, the father never says anything directly to his son, does he? I would hope in real life he would. But in this story, the father doesn't say, son, it's okay, I love you. None of that. He speaks through his actions, though, doesn't he? His son comes, gets part of that apology out, and the father immediately turns and demands that certain things be done. Concrete actions are taken at this point. There's no lecture. There's definitely no, I told you so, here is there. Of all people who know what sin is, it's the son. He understands this. There are times when we do need to explain sin, when people don't care or don't know this son knows. And so the father responds with this welcome home. The son returns, and the father immediately gets the ball rolling to have this huge celebration. Uh, just a note on the ring in verse 22, some have suggested that this was the family signet ring, which is basically like a, a signature back then. And so in a sense, this was almost like giving the young man full access to the family's finances again. Even though he blew his one-third of it, it's saying, welcome back, and here's the checkbook. Here's the family debit card, we might say today. Um, if you had the family ring, you had the ability to buy and sell and do business on the father's behalf. And so he's welcome home in a, a full and comprehensive way. Also notice the reference to sandals. As I understand it, slaves went barefoot back then. Only the family would wear sandals on their feet. Uh, back during the days of slavery here in the United States, a dark time in, in our history, uh, slaves noticed this reference and they had a song they would sing in worship uh, referring to all of God's children having shoes. And we think, what in the world does that mean? Well, I think having read this parable and knowing the background to it, um, slaves in this country were looking forward to that time. All of God's children wear shoes. That detail was especially significant to them. And the point of these details is to let us know that this young man who had left is now back. He is on the inside, fully accepted. He is not on probation, but he's fully back, fully part of the family again. This is how God treats those who return as well. Some of you might remember I preached on this a few years ago, and while I was looking over the lesson at breakfast down at the Cottage Cafe, there was a new server there, and I had to break her in. You know, she's new to this, and I explained that I use this hour from 6 to 7 at Cottage Cafe while I eat to make the sermon shorter. I'm whacking sections that don't need to be there. And she said, oh, I wish our pastor would do that. <laughs> and I got a kick out of that. But a few minutes later, she walked by, and she noticed the title of the lesson. Uh, the lesson about the prodigal son or the son who leaves. And I remember her stopping there in front of me. And she got choked up a little bit. And she said, you know, this story is about daughters, too. There are prodigal daughters as well. And that is absolutely true, isn't it? But we learn from this that all of us are always welcome to come home, both sons and daughters. God is always there on the front porch, watching and waiting 
and eager to come out and run and meet us on the road. If we are willing to truly turn from sin and come home, he's ready uh, to meet us along the way. Let's close tonight by looking at what happens next. This is Luke chapter 15, verses 25 through 32. Luke 15, 25 through 32. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of his servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years... I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. So now we have a response from the older son. You know, this parable could have ended in verse 24, and it would have been an awesome story. It would have made the point that Jesus was making, but the Lord continues. And notice the response from the older son. Although Jesus never applies it directly, it's pretty obvious who this man represents. The older brother represents the scribes and the Pharisees, doesn't he? He comes in from the field after working all day, apparently, and he hears this celebration, so he talks to one of his servants. Notice, (laughs) he's got his own servants. And so he talks to one of his servants. He finds out that his younger brother has returned. However, he gets angry And he refuses even to go in. And so his younger brother has returned from a distant country, a long distance. And now the older brother, he isn't even returning from the field. He won't even make that little trip to go in and meet with his father. And his father goes outside. So his father meets the younger son along the road. Now the father is meeting the older son between the field and the house. And to me, all this is interesting. The father not only goes out and meets the younger brother on the road, but is also concerned about the older brother, even to the point of meeting him outside. Uh, In a sense, both sons have been lost, just for different reasons, and one looked a whole lot lost than the other, although both were really in that category. Uh, But the son responds in a very self-righteous and defensive way, doesn't he? And to me, it seems that the older son is now uh, the one to dishonor his own father. He's now doing what the younger son did previously. In other words, the younger son is now doing uh, what the younger son did. He's condescending, he's demanding toward his own father. He starts out with the word, look. If a conversation starts out with that, it usually doesn't go well. I had a professor in college who said, if somebody comes to me and as they start the conversation, they're pulling up their pants and saying something, look at here, you know, it's not going to end well. And that seems to be what's going on here. It just rubs me the wrong way. Um, it's certainly not how you would address your father in a respectful way. He continues by saying that he's been serving his father for many years. What's he doing there? He's, he's picturing himself as a slave. He's trying to make his dad feel bad or look bad. You know, look, dad, I've, I've slaved, I've, I've served you all these many years. So not, not respectful at all. He's skewing this whole situation. Then he says he has never neglected a command. <laughs> Is that true? Personally, that seems to be quite the stretch. How many of us can truthfully say that we have never disobeyed our parents? Can any of us say that? Can any child say that? And yet this man says it. I have never disobeyed a command of yours. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would truly be rare if this is the case here. And so he seems to exaggerate his own goodness In a few weeks, we're getting to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, where the Pharisee prays in the temple and basically says, just paraphrasing here, but God, you're pretty blessed. You're pretty lucky to have somebody like me as one of your followers, as one of your children. That's a really arrogant thing to say, but that's what we see here. Notice how many times the older brother uses the word I in verse 29. 
It's one of the most selfish verses in the whole Bible. I, 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 and I. Just I. Me. Very self-centered here. And he's mad. He's angry that his dad has never given him even a young goat so he can party with his friends. Note, there is a difference between a fattened calf and a young goat. One is meant for celebration. The other isn't even ready to be killed yet. Scrawny little goat. You, you know, you haven't even done that for me, Dad. You haven't even given me a small, immature animal to party with my friends. So the older brother complains uh, that he hasn't even been given this young goat. In verse 30, notice how he talks about his own brother. He is not his brother, but it's this son of yours. I think about uh, maybe a young married couple with a new child <laughs> and saying, you'll never believe what this kid of yours did. It's not my son, it's, it's your kid. You know, did this terrible sharpie on the wall or, or something. We're, we're reattributing the ownership of the child to somebody else. This son of yours has devoured your wealth with prostitutes and he's getting a party. Uh, by the way, as far as we can tell, the older brother hasn't even talked to the younger brother yet, if I'm correct on that, right? They're both outside still, the father and the older brother. So I would ask, how does he know that the younger brother wasted his money on prostitutes? Hmm, a little bit of speculation there. Some have suggested that the older brother is projecting this onto the younger brother. In other words, if I had been given that much money, that's what I would have done with it. All right, so that's perhaps or maybe even probably true here. And yet the father responds with encouragement. He responds with a reminder that the older son has always been a part of the family. All that's mine is yours, always has been, always will be. So sure, we didn't go kill a goat for you, but you actually own all the goats out here anyway. And the father explains that we had to celebrate because this brother of yours, not this son of mine, this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. So again, not my son, but this brother, he's trying to personalize this again. He's reminding the older son that the young man is actually his brother. You two are family. You need to be happy about this. And that seems to be the point here. Instead of whining that Jesus is eating with sinners, the scribes and the Pharisees need to realize that Jesus is reaching out to their own spiritual family. He's also pointing out that the older brother is really just as much of a sinner as his younger brother, if not more so, even though he never leaves home. We can sin with a bad attitude. We can be lost right here at home. We can never leave the Lord uh, we can actually uh, sin without actually leaving the Lord. I guess I might, uh, there's a better way of putting that. A thought question here as we come near the end. Did the father love the younger son more than he loved the older son? Did the shepherd love the lost sheep more than he loved the other sheep? Did the woman love the lost coin more than she loved the other nine coins? Absolutely not. But each person in those stories focused on what was lost. That's, it's a matter of focus. They focused on what needed attention at the moment. And that's what Jesus is doing by eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. It has been said that there are two types of people in this world. Sinners who admit that they're sinners. And sinners who do everything to cover up the fact that they're sinners. And I think we see both of these in the parable of the lost son. The younger son admits it and comes out on top. He's the one we want to be like. The, young, the older son is the one who refuses to admit it. I know we focused on the impact these three parables would have had on the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus told these stories in response to their grumbling, so these are focused at them. But I would also ask, what kind of impact would these stories have had on the sinners that Jesus was eating with here? Imagine being a tax collector. Imagine being a sinner. Imagine being a former prostitute sitting down eating with Jesus here. And imagine hearing these stories about searching for a lost sheep and a lost coin and a father welcoming home the lost son. And then imagine being the sheep and the coin and the son in these stories. I would imagine that this would have been very encouraging. And that's where we leave it tonight. So I'm thankful for your good attention tonight. Uh, thank you for being with us either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns, anything we need to be remembering in our bulletin. And then next week, let's come together on September 2nd 
and be ready to study Luke chapter 16. Just an awesome chapter. I'm looking forward to class next week. It's hard to believe that next Wednesday is already September 2nd. Where has the summer gone? Uh, let's close tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being a loving Father who always welcomes us home. You are the good shepherd who goes looking for the one lost sheep. Thank you for making us a part of your family, whether we've been in your house for many years or whether we've recently returned. Thank you for your love and grace and your mercy and forgiveness. All of us have truly sinned against heaven and in your sight. We pray that we might pay more attention to those who are lost that we would go looking, that we would reach out, that we would search, that we would welcome all who return. We pray that you would continue to forgive us just as we forgive those who sin against us. As we look at the pain and the chaos that we see around us in the world right now, we pray that you would protect our hearts, that we would not get discouraged or disillusioned by what we see happening around us, but that we would always do what is right. We've learned tonight that we can sin not only in the things that we do, but we can also sin with a bad attitude. And so we pray, Father, that our hearts would be pure, that we would love you first above all others, and that we would love our neighbors just as we love ourselves. We ask a special blessing tonight on those in positions of authority. We pray that you would bless our president, our governor, the mayor of the city of Madison, and all others who have the power to execute justice. We pray that we might be able to live quiet lives in all godliness and dignity, just as you have instructed us to do. Tonight, we also pray for teachers as they make last-minute preparations for the new school year. We pray for students as they go back to learning during these uncertain times. We pray for our college students that they would have a safe and profitable semester. For Tabitha in Tennessee, for Spencer in Kentucky, for Catherine and Maya and Elijah here in Madison. We come to you with these requests, both thanking you and praising you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.